Carey. Thank you so much for joining me on this latest episode of Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma. This is episode 19, and we're going to talk about what an abusive relationship is and what it looks like. I'm going to add a little disclaimer here because we're going to be discussing specific aspects of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, and it could be triggering. If it is, pause the episode, do some mindful belly breathing or any of the other tools we've learned or one you like to use to get grounded, centered, and feel safe. Then come back when you're ready. I am so glad we're walking the path towards healing together. So just a quick reminder, I'm not a clinician, counselor, or physician. I'm a certified trauma support specialist with lots of lived experience with trauma. Also, the information presented in this podcast is for educational purposes only and not meant to replace treatment by a doctor or any other licensed professional. Here's an added note. If you are in a relationship where your safety, mental, physical, and emotional health are at risk, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 for help in leaving the relationship safely and for other resources. And if you're in a situation where you feel you are in immediate danger, please call 911. All right, let's dive in. So in the last few episodes, we've been talking about relationships, about what a healthy and an unhealthy relationship looks like. Well, unhealthy relationships can at times feel abusive. There is a big difference between something that's unhealthy and something that's abusive. This topic is so very important to me personally. As a survivor and as somebody who's worked with other survivors for over 12 years now, it couldn't be more important. An abusive relationship is defined as where there are patterns of behaviors used by one partner to maintain power and control over another partner in an intimate relationship. Yes, of course, you can be abused by other people, such as family members or friends, but we're talking today about a relationship involving two people in a romantic or intimate partner situation. I'm going to start off by saying abusers are slick. They hide who they really are until they've got us hooked. To everyone else, they're wonderful people. They're charming, well-mannered, funny. Everybody loves them. They seem to be pillars of the community. They help everyone out. They can seem to be a great friend, the one everybody can always count on. But that's the front they put on for the rest of the world. This isn't who they are behind closed doors. They absolutely know that what they do to their partner could get them into trouble. So they hide it really, really well from everyone else. When we first meet them, they don't have giant red warning labels on them screaming, danger, warning, run away. They should, but they don't. We're taken in by their charm, sense of humor, looks, manners, Everything about them pulls us in. I know when I met my abuser, and I was awfully young too, I was in my teens, I thought he was the end-all, be-all of everything. I thought he was everything I could ever want in a romantic partner. He was handsome and funny in that bad boy, southern rebel kind of way. Everything about him drew me in. They shower us with love, kindness, caring, and they pay attention to everything we say. It's called love bombing. They listen to us, really hear us, and we feel understood 
maybe for the first time ever by another person. For those of us with a trauma history, it's like catnip to a cat. We soak up all that love and attention we didn't get growing up. We can also be drawn in by their intensity. They're passionate about things. Often, right after we start seeing them, and for me, it was literally like a week after I met my abuser, they can look deeply into our eyes and say something like, I've never felt this way before about anyone, but I'm in love with you. Sound familiar? With almost every survivor I've ever worked with, this is how it started. And things can move pretty quickly right after that. I know I moved in with my abuser within that first week. I was moved in and living in his house. We feel like we're wrapped up in this cocoon of love and warmth. It's bliss. We begin taking care of them, doing little things for them. They need us. And so those of us with a caregiver's tendency fall right into those old familiar patterns. We love them. So it's natural that we should want to take care of them and make them happy, right? In the beginning, they seem to care for us just as much too. They do little things for us just to make us happy. But at some point, the scales begin to tip and the balance begins to shift. It could begin at any point and seemingly innocent enough. Maybe they start making little comments about things we're doing or not doing. Maybe the meal we made wasn't quite right. Maybe the laundry did for them came out a little wrinkled and they don't like wrinkles. Maybe they make a little comment about what we're wearing on a particular day. Small things, nothing major. We apologize profusely and promise to do things better next time. They seem satisfied and life goes on. Then, maybe when something isn't to their liking next time, they yell at us or say something nasty to us. It startles us. It stings a little more than what they'd said to us before. They might follow their behavior up with an, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, and trying to make it seem better. Again, we apologize, feeling like we just can't do things correctly. Obviously, it's our fault, right? It must be us. They also begin to not want us to go anywhere or do anything without them. Now, when a relationship is first new and exciting, it's normal to want to be with that person most or all of the time, to do things with them, experience things together. However, over time, this being joined at the hip behavior becomes controlling. We might not even seem to be able to go to the grocery store alone or run an errand without them coming along. If we do, we might get questioned about what we did, who we saw, did we go anywhere else. They might be suspicious of who we were around, even going so far as to accuse us of cheating on them. After a while, to avoid these situations, we either have them come with us or we don't go anywhere at all. When I had my car, my abuser would take parts off of it and put them under his pillow at night while he slept to make sure I couldn't leave without him. Also over time, and almost without our even knowing it, they start cutting us off from friends and even family. At first, they'll go with us to family get-togethers or to see our friends. But soon, they might begin to make comments expressing their dislike for these people in our lives. Perhaps they make comments about how they feel these people treated us or that they felt they saw these people manipulate us, talk down to us, whatever it might be. We begin to question these other people's motives in our minds, thinking that our abuser must be right. We must be missing something. So we might then begin to start making excuses for why we can't come to get togethers anymore with our family or friends. You know, 
this has come up. I'm sorry, we're too busy another time. You know, those general types of excuses. But after a while, after hearing nothing but excuses from us at every invite, people might stop inviting us to come over or go out or do things at all. We opt out in order to keep the peace at home. Over time, this just adds to the isolation, cutting us off from any support system we might have had. The abuser tells us that they are all we need, but their friends, family, and connections are important. My abuser's friends were always around. The party was always at our house. They watched as he abused me in almost every way, and no one ever stepped in to help. I also had to help take care of his father, who had very advanced Parkinson's disease. He also drank very heavily. He would mess himself, and I was expected to clean him up and take care of him. He would also take every opportunity to grope me, every chance he got. It was awful, but I didn't dare complain. Another isolation tactic is the abuser moving with us to a new state or a place where we aren't near any of our support systems, friends, family, things that are familiar. We might move to somewhere rural, remote, away from big cities or towns. When I was with my abuser, we were already in a remote small town. So cutting me off was easy. I was already four states away from my family in Ohio. We had no phone, and this was long before cell phones, so I had no way to even call for help. His uncle lived right next door, however. One night, to avoid getting physically hurt, not long after moving in with him, I ran out of the house to his uncle's place, banging on the door, screaming for help. His daughter opened the door and I begged her to let me in. I was terrified my abuser would find me. I knew he was right on my heels. I was completely panicked. From somewhere in the house, I heard his uncle tell his daughter to shut the door. She gave me a sympathetic look, then shut the door in my face. So needless to say, no help from them or anyone. They also might begin to sabotage us at work, if we're allowed to work at all. They might begin calling us constantly at work, checking up on us. The constant calls might be noticed by our coworkers or our boss. If abusers really want to cause trouble, they might begin calling our boss or coworkers directly, trying to get us fired by making things up about us. Then they might do things like disable our car or torpedo any childcare arrangements we might have. They might not leave us with money for public transportation. I wasn't allowed to work and my abuser didn't work either. His father gave us money sometimes for food or we literally had to go out and find our own food. There was one time someone my abuser knew hired us to clean up an old abandoned mobile home he bought. He was an older man, not married, and he wanted to clean up this mobile home to rent it out. The whole place was literally inches deep with mouse droppings and dead mice. It was awful. And I swear, one of my superpowers, unfortunately, now is I can smell mice anywhere. It was terrible but I worked really hard at it every day. This man also took the opportunity to grab and grope at me every chance he got. When I finally did tell my abuser about it, he said it was my fault. He blamed me for it. As we become more and more isolated, the violence gets worse. It doesn't have to be physical either. That's still one of the biggest myths so many survivors still believe. You know, they didn't hit me, so it's not abuse. Emotional, verbal, mental, financial, sexual, and now digital abuse are just as damaging. 
there were times that I was going through such torture in all of these other ways, I would often wish to myself that he would just hit me and get it over with. He would keep me up for days at a time, making me sit with him while he drank and listened to his music. He would get so drunk that he would forget who I was and he would think I was just somebody he picked up. He would berate me, yell, threaten, and degrade me at every turn. It did get physical, too. Closed fist hits to the head, slammed into walls, slammed down on a concrete, against tables and furniture. He also liked to hold a gun to my head, hitting me repeatedly on the head with the butt of the gun. And when I would fall down, he would kick me repeatedly everywhere. I still have trouble with my right knee after a really vicious kick. I thought he'd broken my leg at the time. He also had a big, old, fluffy, sweet, sweet dog that he had just gotten when we first met. I loved that dog so much. He knew it too. So when he was feeling particularly cruel in order to teach me a lesson, He would beat the dog with a shovel, the kind he used to dig in the ground with, the shovel part being heavy iron or steel. And he made me watch. That was the most horrible thing to me. So much worse than me being hurt myself. I would have endured anything to keep that from happening. And my abuser knew it. And he used it to keep me in line. Abusers also do something called gaslighting, and it can be a very effective method of control for them. It's a way to manipulate us in order to gain control. They make us question our own judgment, sanity, decisions, reality, everything about ourselves. They do this by making up lies and stories about things we say happened. They twist our view on things saying that what we think happened either didn't happen the way we said it did or it didn't even happen at all. They might minimize or be insensitive to our feelings, saying things like, you're crazy or I was just joking, you're being dramatic or you're making this all about you. They can be a bit of a know-it-all and will keep driving their points and opinions home. They can also flat out deny events that we say happened. They justify their version of events, and they can completely override our memories of things with untrue statements and beliefs. They can continually interrupt us, challenging every thought we have. They know that keeping us confused and doubting ourselves, lacking confidence in ourselves, just tightens the control they have over us. Then they use positive reinforcement praising us for something they feel we did well to throw us off even more. Again, we stop and question ourselves first. I mean, what they say makes sense, right? It must be us. There's that fundamental idea that something is wrong with us. It's our fault. I mean, they love us and just have our best interests at heart, right? We are also pulled along into their own personal drama. And this could look like anything from small issues to extreme situations. Like I said, abusers can have a hugely overinflated sense of themselves. They are always right, no matter what. And even though they put up a false self or a front to the world, they can challenge everybody, including the law. My abuser had been in and out of jail for several things over the years. He also had this sort of vigilante view of justice, which is why one night after just moving in with him, I found myself sitting in the passenger seat of my car while he was driving with a sawed off shotgun across my lap. He was going to go get someone he believed had broken into his house, something over a drug deal gone wrong. Thank God. This guy wasn't home when we got there. 
So I'm going to share something that is an extreme example of getting pulled into drama. One morning, we were sleeping at the house, and it was about 7 a.m. There was this giant house shaking boom. My first thought was that something had exploded or else somebody had run into our house with a car. Suddenly, there were three guys in our bedroom with FBI jackets on, holding guns on us, screaming at us to get up. They ignored our repeated requests as to what was going on. They wouldn't tell us. They sat us in the living room and tore the house apart, going through absolutely everything. They showed us the warrant they had, but there were no specifics listed in it. They kept asking us questions about where we'd been recently. Had we been out of the state for any reason? After about three hours, they said they were taking us to the county sheriff's office for questioning. They put my abuser in a holding cell and sat me down at a desk. Finally, I got the details. Apparently, two weeks prior, a cab driver said he was kidnapped at gunpoint by a man and a young woman in Washington, D.C. They made him drive to somewhere in Virginia where they made him get out of the car and then they took the car and left. When he reported the incident to police, he worked with an artist to create composite sketches of both people. When he was shown photos, he picked out my abuser's picture and said he thought it was him. Then somehow, they showed him a picture of me, and again, he said it looked like the young woman who was with the man. The cab driver said that this woman seemed quiet and afraid. So during questioning, the officers took turns going back and forth between saying things like, we know it was you, we know you both did this, to you must have been afraid of him. We know he forced you, admit it. And if you do, nothing will happen to you. It wasn't us, of course. We hadn't even left our town in weeks. They even walked me into a jail cell and told me horror stories of how awful and dangerous jail could be for someone like me. They knew my background. They knew I'd never been in trouble with the law before. They knew my parents were upper middle class, everything. The whole thing was just so completely surreal. I mean, how the hell did I even end up here involved in this? Thus began a four month nightmare of my abuser being in jail. He was moved to Baltimore, Maryland, and I had a lawyer who was located in another town in Maryland. My mom actually came down and stayed with me, which amazed me and drove me back and forth to my lawyer and took me to hearings for my abuser. Suddenly one day out of the blue, my abuser called from jail. He said he was being released and we were being cleared of all charges. Apparently, the police had gone back to this cab driver, showed him our photos again, and he immediately said, no, that's not them. So just like that, it was over. My abuser came home, and it was a week-long, no-sleep, constant party for him and his buddies. Not for me, of course. My mother left and went home. She asked me to come with her, but I knew that if I left, he would come after us, and I didn't want anything to happen to her. So I stayed. I literally ran for my life five different times, thinking I'd left for good, but I was always drawn back by him, his promises that he was getting help and that he'd changed. His mother also lied, saying the same kinds of things to get me to come back. She was sure I was the only person who could help her son, and she told me this over and over. So when she told me he was seeing someone and getting help and that he was different, I believed her. But I'd come back and realized pretty quickly it was all just lies and manipulation. Things would be great for a while, and then things would start up again until I was right back in that awful, horrifying situation. 
every time we leave and go back, the abuser makes it harder and harder for us to leave again. The average number of times it takes for someone to leave an abusive relationship is seven times. Don't be a part of this statistic, please. Leave and stay gone. Cut off all contact if you can. And I know if you have children, it can be harder, but go through legal channels only. If they plead with you to see the kids, remember, it really isn't about the kids. It's about getting to you. They will do and say exactly what they know you want to hear to get you back. No matter what they say and do, it will not change. They will not change. I can't stress this enough. It's like a war that they are determined to win at all costs, no matter who gets hurt. And it will be you and your children, if you have them, that will get hurt. This is an unwinnable war for you. Again, over time, almost without us knowing it, we are completely cut off, controlled, used, and abused. We doubt everything about ourselves, right down to our sanity and what's real. We have no money, no way out, no escape. Our abusers might tell us over and over again that we couldn't make it without them and that no one else would want us and that we should feel lucky that they put up with us. We have become completely deflated as human beings with no self-confidence, no self-worth, no support, no safety, no escape. We live our lives constantly on that edge, just waiting for the next thing, the next blow up, the next time we get hurt. We know it's coming, but we don't know when or how or what shape it'll take. We are kept constantly on guard. We do everything in our power, everything to make sure things are perfect. We do things perfectly. We do everything they want, how they want it, so that we don't give them any ammunition. But it doesn't matter how hard we try, how perfect we are, look or behave, they will find something, anything to find fault with us. One time I was literally beaten for stirring a pot of soup with the wrong spoon. No human being can ever, ever be perfect. It just doesn't exist. Human beings are perfectly imperfect and we all make mistakes have flaws, but it's okay. That makes us who we are. What no one ever deserves is to be with anyone who exploits us, hurts us, uses us, or abuses us in any way. I have gone over some of the most common forms that an abusive relationship can take, but it is by no means a complete list. There could be things you're experiencing and if it feels wrong to you in any way, please plan to get out as soon as possible. When you're trying to leave an abusive relationship, either on your own or with children, safety planning is crucial. Here are some things you can do to help you get out safely. The overall plan is to be able to leave safely and quickly when you need to. So first, if you have children and it's age appropriate, discuss your safety plan with them. Think of a code word, something that they will know and remember. Teach them that if you say that word to them, they need to either run out of the house to a neighbor or know that this signals you'll be leaving. Teach them how to call 911. Also, if possible, have them memorize your address and phone number to be able to give it to a dispatcher or police officer if needed. 
So first, begin to put away important documents and information you will need to take with you. This could be social security cards, ID cards, driver's licenses, visas, passports, birth certificates for you and your children, immunization records, medical records, any important personal documentation that you might need. Put all of the necessary information in a bag or backpack, something you can grab and go with in an emergency. Place it somewhere your abuser won't find it. Also pack a couple of days worth of clothes for you and your children as well. Get refills of any medication you or your children need and hide them in your grab and go bag. Plan for a place to go. This could be a friend, a family member, or a domestic violence shelter near you. Make sure you have all of the numbers you need. Also make sure you have your local domestic violence shelter's hotline or crisis line in your phone so you can call immediately if you need shelter. It's a good idea to call ahead to the shelter and talk to an advocate and ask them about their procedure for being admitted to shelter. Digital safety is also hugely important. Remember, your abuser can track your online browsing history, so be sure to clear your browser after every computer search. So, for example, if you use Google as your browser, go to your search history in My Activity. You can choose the search history you want to delete. In most browsers, you can go into Settings and delete your browsing history there. And this goes for your cell phone as well. A good idea is to have a backup cell phone hidden where you can get to it easily in an emergency. It doesn't have to be any fancy. It could just be a basic, cheap phone, something you can use to call your emergency numbers or 911 if your abuser takes your main phone. If you have a car, keep it full of gas. Make an extra set of car or house keys accessible only to you and hidden in case your abuser takes your keys. If they disable your car in order to keep you from leaving, call 911 immediately. If you can, begin to put money aside in a bank account that only you have access to. Make sure that you keep PIN numbers, passwords, everything private and safe and only accessible to you. Believe me when I tell you that intimate partner violence or domestic violence is an equal opportunity employer. It doesn't matter what your background is, your education level, how much money you have, what race you are, nothing. It doesn't matter. Anyone from any and all walks of life can find themselves in this situation. I mean, when we meet someone and we fall in love, we all want it to work out. We want it to be that thing that we're looking for, whatever it is we feel we need from a romantic partner. For those of us with a trauma history, we're looking to fill up those holes our experiences left us with. Many of us have this ideal built up in our minds. We fall in love with the idea of being in love. And we can often miss or dismiss things that tell us that things aren't right, that gut feeling that warns us, that inner voice is telling you the truth. Listen to it. Trust it. There is hope and help available. Again, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-799. 7233 so that you can plan to leave an abusive relationship safely and to get other resources. And if you're in a situation where you feel you are in immediate danger, do not hesitate to call 911. <sighs> okay, deep breath. That was a lot. Thank you for sticking with me 
during such a hard and awful subject. So this is where I like to close us out with a new exercise and something we can add to that mindfulness toolbox we're building together. Remember, you don't have to do it now or at all if you don't want to, but you might just listen and tuck it away in your mind for future reference. We always start with our mindful belly breathing. Breathe slowly in through your nose, your belly naturally pushing out as you inhale to a count of five. Hold your breath for a count of one. Then slowly exhale out of your mouth. Your belly should naturally move in as you exhale to a count of five. Do this five times. I want to do an easy exercise that supports us in feeling safe. This is a mindfulness visualization exercise that's easy to do. Continue with your mindful belly breathing. You can do this with your eyes open or closed. It's up to you. If your eyes are open, have them rest on something gently. Maybe something that isn't a busy spot. Maybe a blank spot on a wall or a door. Think of a time where you felt like you were your best self, the most calm and the most safe. Where were you? Picture that place in your mind. Hold that image where you're your best self, where you're safe and calm. If you can't bring to mind a safe place or moment from your life, you can create a safe space for yourself now. It can be anywhere in the world or anywhere you can imagine, as long as it feels safe to you. Continue breathing slowly in through your nose and out through your mouth. When you identify that safe place, look around you. What do you see? Casually explore your safe space. Picture yourself looking around or even walking around. Is there a person there with you? Someone who makes you feel safe? If so, invite them to explore with you. If not, continue to explore your safe space on your own, being completely at ease and calmly noticing what is around you. Continue slowly breathing. Notice anywhere in your body that may feel tense. Where is this feeling located? Where is it in your body that you feel this tension? Wherever it is, place your hands gently on that area. If you have an overall feeling of tension that you notice, you could just place your hands on your heart. Continue holding the image of your safe place in your mind. If you're through exploring, you could imagine a nice place to sit and rest. Feel the safety, calm, and peace of that space. Continue breathing slowly. You can stay this way for as long or as short a time as you wish. It's completely up to you. When you're ready, Bring your awareness back to your breathing. If your eyes are closed, open them when you're ready. How do you feel? Do you notice any lessening of your tension? Do you feel calmer, more grounded, a little bit more relaxed? I hope these exercises are something that you found helpful and it's more tools that we're adding to our mindful toolbox that we're building together. Whenever you need to go to that toolbox and pull out any skill we've learned in order to feel more grounded, safe, and connected, do it. 
I've created a list of all the techniques and exercises we've learned on my website, InvisibleWoundsHealingFromTrauma.com, and we'll add to it as we go along. I've also put each exercise to beautiful music and video on my YouTube channel, Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma. Please subscribe if you like what you see and hear. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today and for listening to an extremely difficult topic. And please keep on listening wherever you listen. Please like, subscribe, favorite, follow me, and share, share, share with people you might think could benefit from it. And what you think really matters to me too. So comment on the show. Let me know what you think, whatever's on your mind. You can find me on Facebook at Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma, Twitter, at Carrie Walker 58 and my website, Invisible Wounds Healing from Trauma.com. Look for my new episodes dropping every Monday on all of your favorite podcast, music, and listening apps on the web for Android and for Apple. Please take extra good care of yourself, and we'll talk soon.